Chapter Ten of the Giant's Robe by F. Anstey. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Ten, Repente Turpissimus. No sooner had Mark declared himself the author of his dead friend's book than he would have given anything to recall his words, not so much from conscience, though he did feel he had suddenly developed into a surprisingly finished scoundrel, as from a fear that his lie might, after all, be detected. He sat staring stupidly at Mr. Fladgate, who patted him on the shoulder with well-meant encouragement. He had never seen quite so coy an author before. "'I'm very glad to make Mr. Vincent Beecham's acquaintance at last,' he said, beaming with honest pride at the success of his tactics, "'and now we can come to terms again.' He did not find Mark more difficult to deal with than most budding authors, and in this case Mark was morbidly anxious to get the money part of the transaction over as soon as possible. He could not decide whether his conscience would be better or worse satisfied if he insisted on the best pecuniary terms he could obtain, so in his indecision he took the easier course of agreeing to everything. "'About the title now,' said Mr. Fladgate, when the terms had been reduced to a formal memorandum. "'I don't think I quite like your present one.' too moonshiny eh mark owned that it did sound a little moonshiny i think too i rather think there's something very like it out already and that may lead to unpleasantness you know now can you suggest something else which will give a general idea of the nature of the book as mark had absolutely no idea what the book was about he could not well mr blackshaw suggested something like enchantment or witchery i don't care about either of those said mark who found this sort of dissembling unexpectedly easy no said mr fladgate no i think you're right now i had a notion i don't know what you will think of it but i thought you might call it a modern merlin eh a modern merlin repeated mark thoughtfully yes it's not quite the right thing perhaps but it's taking i think taking mark said it was taking of course your hero is not exactly a magician but it brings in the vivian part of the story don't you see of course mark did not see but he thought it best to agree well continued mr fladgate who was secretly rather proud of his title how does it strike you now it seems to me as good a title as we are likely to hit upon after all mark thought what did it matter it wasn't his book except in name i think it's excellent he said excellent and by the way mr fladgate he added i should like to change the nom de plume it's a whim of mine perhaps but there's another i've been thinking lately i should like better by all means said the other taking up a pencil to make the necessary alteration on the manuscript. But why not use your real name? I prophesy you'll be proud of that book some day. Think over it. No, said Mark, I don't wish my real name to appear just yet. He hardly knew why. Perhaps the lingering sense of shame held him back from this more open dishonesty. Will you strike out Vincent Beecham and put in Cyril Ernstone, please? for cyril ernstone had been the pseudonym which he had chosen long ago for himself and he wished to be able to use it now since he must not use his own very well then we may consider that settled we think of bringing out the book as soon as possible without waiting for the spring season it will go to press at once and we will send you the proofs as soon as we get them there's one thing perhaps i'd better mention said mark suddenly after he had turned to go a new danger had occurred to him the handwriting of the manuscript is not mine i i thought it as well to tell you that beforehand it might lead to mistakes i had it copied out for me by by a friend mr fladgate burst out laughing pardon me he said when he had finished but really i couldn't help it you do seem to have been so bent on hoodwinking us and yet you have found me out you see said mark with a very unmirthful smile 
Mr. Fladgate smiled too, making a little gesture of his hand, thinking very possibly that few precautions could be proof against his sagacity, and they parted. Mark went down the stairs and through the clerk's room into the street, with a dazed and rather awestruck feeling upon him. He hardly realised the treachery he had been guilty of. The temptation had burst upon him so suddenly. His fall had been made so easy for him that he scarcely felt his dishonour, nor was he likely to feel it very keenly so long as only good results should flow from it. But he was vaguely conscious that he was not the same Mark Ashburn who had parted from old Shelford not an hour ago in the street there. He was a man with a new hope in his breast, and it might be a new fear, but the hope was near and bright, the fear shadowy and remote as yet. He had only to keep his own counsel and be patient for a while, and the course of events would assuredly bring him the stake he had played so high for. At home that evening he took down his manuscript novels, which of course he had not burned, and read them again carefully. Yes, there was power in them, he felt, a copious flow of words, sparkling wit, and melting pathos. The white heat at which the lines were written surprised even himself. It was humiliating to think that without the subterfuge that had been forced upon him, he might have found it impossible to find publishers who would appreciate these merits, for after Messrs. Leadbitter and Gandhi's refusal, he had recognised this to the full. But now, at least, they were insured against any such fate. A careful reading was absolutely necessary to a proper estimation of them, and a careful reading they had never had as yet, and would receive at last, or, if they did not, it would only be because the reputation he had appropriated would procure them a ready acceptance without any such preliminary ordeal. The great point gained was that they would be published, and after that he feared nothing. If anything whispered to him that he might have accomplished even this by honourable means, that in time and with economy he could have produced them at his own expense, that perhaps a little more perseverance might even have discovered a firm with sufficient faith to take the risk upon themselves. If these doubts suggested themselves to him, he had little difficulty in arguing them down. They might have had some weight once, but they came too late. The thing was done now, and could never be recalled. His whole interest lay in persuading himself that what he had done was the only thing that could be done, unless he was content to resign his ambition for ever, and Mark succeeded in persuading himself of this. Very soon his chief feeling was one of impatience for Holroyd's book to come out, and make way for his own. Then any self-reproach he might still feel would be drowned in a sense of triumph which would justify the means he had taken so he waited eagerly for the arrival of the first proofs they arrived at last as he came back one evening to malakoff terrace trixie ran to meet him holding up two tightly rolled parcels with a great curiosity in her eyes they came this afternoon she whispered and oh mark i couldn't help it i tore one end a little and peeped are they really part of a book is it yours Mark thought he had better accustom himself to this kind of thing as early as possible. "'Yes, Trixie,' he said. "'They're the first proofs of my book.' "'Oh!' cried Trixie, with a gasp of delight. "'Not Sweet Bells Jangled, Mark?' "'No, not Sweet Bells Jangled. It, "'It's a book you don't know about, "'a little thing I don't expect very much from, "'but my publishers seem to like it, "'and I can follow it up with the bells afterwards.' He was turning over the rough, greyish pages as he spoke, and Trixie was peeping greedily at them too, with her pretty chin dug into his shoulder. "'And did you really write all that?' she said. "'How interesting it looks, you clever boy. You ought to have told me you were doing it, though. What's it about?' "'How can I tell you before I know myself?' said Mark, quite forgetting himself in his impatience. Uh, i mean trixie that i can't correct these proofs as they ought to be corrected while you stay here chattering i'll go in a minute mark but you won't have time to correct them before dinner you know when did you write it what does it matter when i wrote it said mark irritably 
if it hadn't been written the proofs wouldn't be here would they is there anything else you would like to know how i wrote it where i wrote it why i wrote it you seem to think it a most extraordinary thing that anything i write should be printed at all trixie i don't know why you should speak like that mark said trixie rather hurt you know a little while ago you never expected such a thing yourself i can't help wanting to know all i can about it what will you say to uncle solomon she added with a little quiver of laughter in her voice you promised him to give up literature you know don't you remember the arab gentleman in the poem said mark lightly he agreed to sell his steed but when the time came it didn't come off he didn't come off either he flung them back their gold and rode away i shall fling uncle solomon back his gold metaphorically and gallop off on my pegasus ma won't like that prophesied trixie shaking her head wisely no mother objects to that kind of horse exercise and ahem <coughs> trixie it might be as well to say nothing about it to any of them just at present there will only be a fuss about it and i can't stand that trixie promised silence i'm so glad about it though you can't think mark she said and this isn't one of your great books either you said didn't you no said mark it's not one of them i haven't put my best work into it you put your best work into the two that came back didn't you asked trixie naively but they won't come back any more will they they'll be glad of them if this is a success flaggate will be glad of them i fancy in any case i've got a chance at last trixie a chance at last later that night he locked himself in the room which he used as a sitting-room and bedroom combined and set himself not without repugnance to go steadily through the proofs and make the acquaintance of the work he had made his own much has been said of the delight with which an author reads his first proofs and possibly the sensation is a wholly pleasurable one to some to others it is not without its drawbacks ideas that seemed vivid and bright enough when they were penned have a bold tame look in the new form in which they come back the writer finds himself judging the work as a stranger's and forming the worst opinions of it he sees hideous gaps and crudities beyond all power of correction and for the first time perhaps since he learned that his manuscript was accepted his self-doubts returned to him but mark's feelings were much more complicated than this all the gratified pride of an author was naturally denied to him and it was thoroughly distasteful to him to carry out his scheme of deception by such sordid details as the necessary corrections of printer's errors but he was anxiously eager to find out what kind of a literary bantling was this which he had fathered so fraudulently he had claimed it in blind reliance on a publisher's evident enthusiasm had he made a mistake after all what if it proved something which could do him no credit whatever a trap into which his ambition had led him the thought that this might be so made him very uneasy poor holroyd he thought was a very good fellow an excellent fellow but not exactly the man to write a book of extraordinary merit clever perhaps but clever in an unobtrusive way and mark's tendency was to judge as he expected to be judged himself by outsides with these misgivings crowded upon him he sat down to read the opening chapters he was not likely to be much overcome by admiration in any case for his habitual attitude in studying even the greatest works was critical as he felt the presence of eccentricities or shortcomings which he himself would have avoided but at least as he read on his greatest anxiety was set at rest if he could judge by the instalment before him and the book was not in any danger of coming absolutely to grief it would do his reputation no harm it was not to be sure the sort of book he would have written himself as he affected the cynical mode of treatment and the indiscriminate satire which a rather young writer feels instinctively that the world expects of him still it was not so bad it was slightly dreamy and mystical in parts the work of a man who had lived more amongst books than in the world but some of the passages glowed with the rich imagery of a true poet and here and there were indications of a quiet and cultivated humour which would recommend itself to all who do not consider the humorous element in literature as uncanny 
if not personally offensive the situations were strong too and as nearly new as situations can be and retain any probability in this over plagiarized world and at least one of the characters was obviously studied from life with a true and tender observation all of this mark did not see nor was he capable of seeing but he thought that with a little weeding and writing up the book would do and set himself to supply what was wanting with a laudable self-devotion his general plan of accomplishing this may be described here once for all he freshened up chapters with touches of satire and gave them a more scholarly air by liberal allusions to the classics he rewrote some of the more descriptive and romantic passages putting his finest and most florid epithets into them with what he felt was very like disinterestedness and a reckless waste of good material and he cut down the dialogue in places or gave it a more colloquial turn so as to suit the tastes of the average reader and he worked up some of the crises which struck him as inadequately treated after that he felt much easier either considering that these improvements constituted a sort of atonement or that they removed any chance of failure as this book was to go forth and herald his own it was vitally important that it should make as imposing an appearance as possible End of chapter 10chapter eleven of the giant's robe by f anstey this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter eleven revolt one afternoon early in the year mark had betaken himself to the cock where he was to lunch with his uncle by appointment before going with him to the steward's office of his inn to pay his fees for the privilege of being called to the bar for Mark had duly presented himself for the not very searching ordeal by which the public is guaranteed against the incompetence of practitioners, and rather to his own surprise had not been required to try again. Call night was announced in the windows of the law wig-makers, and Uncle Solomon, in high delight, resolved that his nephew should join the next batch of barristers, had appointed this day for choosing the wig and gown, and settling all other preliminaries, he had been so much pleased, in fact, as to enclose a handsome cheque in the letter which conveyed his desires. So Mark waited by the hoardings of the new law courts until his relative should join him. Mark was not at ease. He was nerving himself to make a statement which he felt would come upon his uncle as a far from gratifying surprise. He had put it off from time to time out of weakness, or, as he had told himself, from diplomacy now he could do so no longer uncle solomon had hinted terrible things in his letter of a certain brief with which his own solicitor was to entrust the brand new barrister the morning after his call but for this mark might have let things drift as he would strongly have preferred to do but this threat of immediate employment drove him to declare himself he firmly believed that his true vocation was the one he had secured at such cost to his self-respect. He was willing enough to bear the title of barrister, but he had no intention of devoting himself seriously to the profession. He saw little more attraction in the bar than in teaching, and the most self-confident man might have recoiled at having work thrust into his hands before he had undergone the slightest practical training for conducting it and Mark's imagination saw his first brief bringing others in its train, until he should sink in a sea of blue foolscap, helpless and entangled in clinging tentacles of red tape. Perhaps this was a groundless alarm, but he had planned out a particular career for himself, a career of going about and observing, and it is well known that what a man of genius calls observing is uncommonly like ordinary people's enjoyment being famous and flattered and sitting down in moments of inspiration to compose with a clear head and a mind unhampered by all other considerations now the responsibility of legal work would hamper him he felt his muse to be of that jealous disposition which will suffer no rival if he meant to be free at all he must strike the blow at once and so as has been said he was not at his ease 
Mr. Lightowler appeared as St. Clement Danes struck half-past one. He was in high good humour, jubilant and ruddy. "'Well, Master Barrister,' he said, chuckling, "'to think of my living to see you figuring about in a wig and gown. You must cut off that moustache of yours, though, Mark. None of the young barrister fellows I see going up in the train of a morning wear em. I'm told the judges don't consider too much air respectful, eh? Well, I suppose we go in and have a bit of something, eh? The cock, is it? Ah, uh, I haven't been in here. I haven't been in here not since I was a young man on the road, as we used to call it. I don't mean I was ever in the Dick Turpin line, but a commercial gentleman, you know. Well, I've made my way since. You'll have to make yours, with more help than I ever had, though. Mark led the way up a steep little passage, and into the well-known room, with its boxes darkened by age, its sawdusted floor and quaint carved Jacobean mantelpiece. He chose a compartment well down at the bottom of the room. "'What's your particular preference, eh?' said Uncle Solomon, rather as if he was treating a schoolboy. "'What's their speciality here now? Well, you can give me—' he added to the waiter with the manner of a man conferring a particular favour you can give me a chump chop and a dun and a sausage and bring this young gentleman the same i don't care about anything every this time of day he explained mark talked on all kinds of topics with desperate brilliancy for some time he wanted time before approaching the subject uncle solomon broached it for him "'You'll want a regular set of chambers by and by,' he said. "'I've seen a room down Middle Temple Lane that'll do for you for the present. "'When the briefs begin to come in, we'll see about something better. "'I was talking about you to Ferret the other day,' he went on. "'It'll be all right. "'He's going to instruct their London agent to send you in a little something "'that you can try your prentice hand at directly. "'Isn't that behaving like an uncle to you, eh? "'I hope you will go and do me credit over it. "'That's the only way you can pay me back a little. "'I ask but that of you, Mark.' "'For all his bumptiousness and despotism, "'there was a real kindness, "'possibly not of the purest and most unselfish order, "'but still kindness in his manner, "'and Mark felt a pang at having to reward it as he must. "'The meal was over now, "'and Uncle Solomon was finishing the glass of whisky and water before him. "'Well,' he said, as he set it down, "'We'd better be off to the place where I'm to pay the fees for you. Uh, "'What you young fellows cost to start nowadays?' "'That's it,' said Mark. "'I I would rather not cost you anything, Uncle.' "'It's rather late in the day to be particular about that, I should say.' "'It is. I feel that. But I mean, I don't want to cost you any more.' "'What do you mean by that?' "'I mean that I don't care about being called to the bar at present.' "'Don't you? Well, I do. To let that be enough for you. If I'm willing to pay, I don't see what you have to say against it. All you've got to do is to work.' "'Uncle,' said Mark, in a low voice, "'I must tell you what I feel about this. I—I I don't want to cause you to spend your money on false pretenses.' "'You better not. That's all I can tell you.' precisely said mark so i'll be quite frank with you beforehand if you set your mind on it i will take my call to the bar will you though that's very affable of you now yes i will but i shall never practise if ferret's agent sends me his brief i shall decline it i would that's the way to get on at the bar you're a sharp fellow you are i don't want to get on at the bar i don't mean to take it up there if you choose to be angry i can't help it i've told you then may i take the liberty of inquiring how you purpose to live demanded uncle solomon i mean to live by literature said mark i know i promised i wouldn't write any more well as far as that goes i've kept my word but but a former book of mine has been accepted on very liberal terms i see my way now to making a living by my pen and though i'm sorry of course if it disappoints you i mean to choose my life for myself while i can it must be highly annoying when one has after infinite labour succeeded in converting a clown to see him come to chapel with a red-hot poker and his pockets full of stolen sausages but even that shock is nothing to uncle solomon's he turned deadly pale and sank back in the box 
glaring at Mark and opening his mouth once or twice with a fish-like action, but without speaking. When he could articulate, he called the waiter, giving Mark reason for a moment to fear that he was going to pour out his rage and disappointment into the ears of one of the smug and active attendants. "'Take for me and this young man, will you?' was all he said, however. When the waiter had reckoned up the sum in the time-honoured manner and departed, Uncle Solomon turned and began to struggle into his greatcoat. "'Let me help you,' said Mark. But Mr. Lightowler indignantly jerked himself away. "'I don't want to be helped into my coat by you,' he said. "'You've helped me into my grave by what you've done this day, you have. But let that be sufficient for you.' When he had rendered himself rather conspicuous by his ineffectual attempts to put on the coat, and was reduced to accept the assistance of two waiters, who shook him into it obsequiously, he came back to the box where Mark was sitting, in a relieved but still vaguely uncomfortable frame of mind. "'I don't want to have many words with you about this,' he began with a sternness that was not unimpressive. "'If I was to let myself out in here, I should go too far. I'll only just tell you this much. This is the second time you've played me this trick, and it's the last.' i warned you before that i should have done with you if you did it again you'll have no more chances like the last so mind that take care of that check you needn't fear i shall stop it but you won't get many more out of me and now i'll bid you good day young gentleman i'm going to kensington and then i shall do a little literary composing on my own account since it's so popular and get ferret to help me with it i'm not one of your literary men but i dare say i can compose something yet that'll be read some day with a good deal of interest it won't be pleasant reading for you though i can tell you he went noisily out the waiters staring after him and the people looking up from their boxes as he passed and mark was left to his own reflections which were of a mixed order he had accomplished his main object his slavery was over and he felt an indescribable relief at the thought still he could not avoid the suspicion that his freedom might have been dearly purchased his uncle's words had pointed to a state of things in which he would have benefited to a considerable extent under his will and that was over now would it not have been worth while to endure a little longer but mark felt strongly that it would not with such prospects as he now saw opening before him the idea of submitting himself to an old man's ambitious whims for the sake of a reward which might, after all, be withheld at last, was utterly revolting. He felt a certain excitement, too, at the idea of conquering the world single-handed. When he left the cock, he walked slowly and irresolutely down the strand. If I go home now, I shall find him blustering there. I don't feel equal to any more of him just now, he thought. He had no club to go to at that time, so he went and read the papers and drank coffee at a cigar divan until it was late enough to dine, and after dinner tried to drown his care by going to see one of those anomalous productions, a three-act burlesque, at a neighbouring theatre, which he sat through with a growing gloom, in spite of the pretty faces and graceful dances, which have now, with some rare exceptions, made plot and humour so unnecessary each leading member of the clever company danced his or her special pas seul as if for a competitive examination but left him unthrilled amidst all the enthusiasm that thundered from most parts of the house it is true that there were faces there and young men's faces quite as solemn as his own but then theirs was a solemnity of an enjoyment too deep for expression while mark's face was blank from a depression he could not shake off he went away at the end of the second act with a confused recollection of glowing groups of silk-clad figures, forming up into a tableau for no obvious dramatic reason, and thinking it better to face his family before the morning, went straight home to Malakoff Terrace. He could not help a slight nervousness as he opened the gate and went up the narrow path of flagstones. The lower window was dark, but there were no lights in the upper rooms, so that he guessed that the family had not retired. Mrs. Ashburn was entirely opposed to the latch-key as a domestic implement, and had sternly refused to allow such a thing to pass her threshold, so that Mark refrained from making use of the key, which of course he had, in all cases where it was not absolutely necessary, 
and he knocked and rang now. Trixie came to the door and let him in. They've sent Anne to bed, she whispered, but Ma and Pa are sitting up for you. Are they, though? said Mark grimly, as he hung up his hat. Yes, said Trixie. Come in here for a minute, Mark, while I tell you all about it. Uncle Solomon has been here this afternoon and stayed to dinner, and he's been saying, oh, such dreadful things about you. Why weren't you here? I thought I should enjoy my dinner more if I dined out, said Mark. Well, and what's the end of it all, Trixie? I'm sure I don't know what it will be. Uncle Solomon actually wanted me to come and live with him at Chigbourne, and said he would make it worth my while in the end if I would promise not to have anything more to do with you. Ah, and when are you going? said Mark, with a cynicism that was only on the surface. When? said Trixie indignantly. Why, never! Horrid old man, as if I cared about his money. I told him what I thought about things, and I think I made him angrier. I hope so, I'm sure. Did he make the same offer to Martha or Cuthbert? asked Mark. And were they indignant too? They weren't asked. I don't think Uncle Solomon cares about them much. You're his favourite, Mark. Yes, I'm his favourite, said Mark. But I'm not proud, Trixie. Besides, I rather think all that is over now. Here the door of the next room opened, and Mrs. Ashburn's voice was heard saying, Trixie, tell your brother Mark that, if he is in a condition to be spoken to, his father and I have something to say to him at once. Encouraging that, said Mark. Well, Trixie, here goes. You'd better go to bed. I'm afraid we are going to have a scene in there. He went in with a rather overdone cheerfulness. Well, mother, he began, attempting to kiss her. I didn't dine at home tonight because— I know why you didn't dine at home, she said. I wish for no kisses from you, Mark. We have seen your uncle. So have I, said Mark. I lunched with him. It is useless to trifle now, she said. We know all. I assure you I did lunch with him. We had chops, said Mark, who sometimes found the bland and childlike manner very useful in these emergencies. It did not serve him then, however. How could you deceive your uncle in such a manner, she resumed. I didn't. I undeceived him. You have disappointed all his plans for you, thrown up the bar, your position at St. Peter's, all your prospects in life. And for what? For fun, of course, mother. I don't know what I'm fit for, or what I want. It's pure idiotic recklessness, isn't it? It is, but don't talk to me in that ribald tone, Mark. I have enough to bear as it is. Once for all I ask you, is it true what my brother tells me, that you have returned to the mire like the sow in the scriptures, that you are going to let your name be connected with— With a novel? after all you have promised. Quite true, said Mark. I hope to be connected with many novels. Mark, said his mother, you know what I think about that. I implore you to pause while there's still time, before doing what you can never recall. It's not only from worldly motives that I ask it. Surely you can sacrifice a contemptible vanity to your duty towards your mother. I may be wrong in my prejudices, but still I have a right to expect you to regard them. I ask you once more to withdraw from this. Are you going to refuse me? Mrs. Ashburn's harsh tones carried a very genuine feeling and concern. She truly believed that the paths of fiction would lead to her son's spiritual as well as his material ruin, and Mark had sense enough to recognize the reality of this belief of hers, and drop the levity he had assumed for defensive purposes. His father had, as usual, taken no part in the interview. He sat looking dolefully at the fire, as if anxious to remain neutral as long as possible. He had long been a mere suzerain, and, like some other suzerains, felt a very modified resentment at a rebellion against an authority that was only nominally his own. So Mark addressed himself to his mother only. "'I'm sorry if it grieves you, mother,' he said gently enough. "'But you really must let me go my own way in this. "'It is no use at all asking me to withdraw now. "'I have gone too far. "'Some day you will see that I was not so very foolish after all. "'I promise you that. "'Wouldn't you rather think of me as living the life I could be happy in? "'Being famous, perhaps, even some day. 
than dragging out my days in a school or slaving at a profession I can never care for? Of course you would. And a novel isn't such an awful thing, if you could only bring yourself to think so. You never will read one, you know, so you can't be a very impartial judge. Mrs. Ashburn read very little of any literature, what she did read being chiefly the sermons and biographies of dissenting divines, and she had never felt any desire to stimulate her imagination by anything much more exciting, especially by accounts of things that never happened, and were consequently untruthful. Her extreme horror of fiction was a form of bigotry now almost extinct, but she had grown up in it and retained it in all the old Puritan vigour. She showed no signs of being at all impressed by Mark's remonstrance. Her eyes were severely cold, and her voice measured and loud as she replied, without looking at him. "'You won't make me change my opinion in the least, Mark, if you were to talk till daylight. If you set yourself against my wishes in this, we have quite made up our minds how to act, have we not, Matthew?' "'Yes, quite,' said Mr. Ashburn, uneasily. "'Quite.' "'But I hope, Mark, my boy, I hope you won't crush your mother in this, "'when you see how strongly she feels about it. "'I want to keep my children about me while I can. "'I don't wish anyone to go if it can be arranged. "'If it can be arranged. "'Do you mean, mother, that if I don't do as Uncle Solomon and you wish, "'I am to go?' asked Mark. "'I do,' said his mother. "'I won't encourage any son of mine against my conscience and my principles.' If you choose to live a life of frivolity and idleness, you shall not lead it under my roof. So you know what to expect if you persist in disobeying me. Us, I mean. I think I had better go, said Mark. I don't quite see what enormity I have been guilty of, but if you look at things in that light, there is no more to be said. I have chosen my life, and I don't mean to go back from it. I will see about finding lodgings as soon as I can, and you shall not be troubled with me any longer than I can help. "'Mark, don't be headstrong. Don't let your passion get the better of you,' cried his mother, moved out of all her stoniness, for she had not quite expected this, believing that the amount of Mark's salary and his expenses made him practically dependent on her. She had forgotten his uncle's cheque, and did not believe in any serious profits to be gained from literature. "'I'm not in the least angry,' he said. "'I don't wish to go, if you wish me to stay, but if you meant what you said just now, I have no choice. His mother was much too proud to weaken her authority by retracting. She still hoped that he would yield if she remained firm, but yielding was out of the question with Mark then, and, besides, independence had its charms, though he would not have been the first to loosen the tie. "'Blame your wicked pride and selfishness, Mark, not your mother, who is only anxious for your good. Go, if you will, but don't dare to expect a blessing on your disobedience. Do you say go too, father? said Mark. You hear what your mother says. What else can I say? He answered feebly. It's very painful to me, all this, but you must take your own course. I see I must, said Mark, and left the room. You've been very hard with the boy, Jane, said her husband when they were alone and she had sat for some time with a book open but unread before her. "'I really do think you've been very hard.' "'Do you want to encourage him against his mother?' she asked. "'No, no, you know I don't, Jane. Anything you think right, but I think you were hard.' "'If I was, it was for his own good,' she said. "'I have done what I thought right, and we have sat up long enough. We can do no good by talking over it any more, Matthew.' "'Perhaps Mark will think differently tomorrow. "'Trixie had been waiting for Mark in the adjoining room, "'into which she beckoned him as he passed the door. "'How did it end?' she whispered. "'You were very quiet in there. Is it settled?' "'Yes, it's settled,' he said. "'I'm to go, Trixie. I shall have to shift for myself. "'They won't have me here any longer.' "'Oh, Mark!' cried Trixie. "'Take me with you, do.' "'It will be so horrid at home with only Martha and Cuthbert. "'You and I always got on together. Let me come, too.' "'I can't,' said Mark. "'Not yet. "'By and by, perhaps, Trixie, when I'm a rich man, you know, we can manage it. "'Just now I shall hardly be able to keep myself. "'I'll work hard at my drawing and get into the academy. "'I've begun features already. 
and I shall soon get into the antique. Then we can be famous together, you know. We shall see, said Mark, and in the meantime, Trixie, I think we had better both go to bed. When he was alone again and had time to think over the day which had proved so eventful, he could not find it in him to regret what had happened. He had got rid of Uncle Solomon, he had cast off the wig and gown, which were to him as the garb of slavery, and the petty restraints of his home life were gone as well. He had no sentimental feelings about his banishment. The bosom of his family had not been a very appreciative or sympathetic one, and he had always intended to go forth from it as soon as he could afford it. If he had really committed the offence for which he was to be driven from home, he could have considered himself a most interesting martyr. He did his best to do so as it was, but not with complete success. Betraying a dead man's trust is scarcely heroic, and even Mark felt that dimly, and could not dwell on his ill-treatment as he would dearly like to have done. But there was something exciting for him notwithstanding in the future. He was to go out into the world and shift for himself, and conquer. He would have a part, and it might be a difficult one, to play for a season, but after that he could resume his own character, and take the place he meant to fill in the world, feeling at last that the applause he won was his by right. Vincent Holroyd had been unselfish in life. Mark had always recognised that trait in his character, though the liking he had for the man had not been much the stronger on that account. If now Vincent could see any brief and fleeting fame which his book might gain, used as a stepping-stone to his friend's advancement, surely, Mark told himself, he would scarcely grudge it. But he hardly cared to justify to himself what he had done by any casuistry of this kind. He preferred to shut his eyes resolutely to the morality of the thing. He might have acted like the basest scoundrel, very likely he had. Still, no one did, no one need, suspect him. All he had to do was to make the best use of the advantage he had snatched. When he could feel that he had done that, then he would feel justified. Meanwhile, he must put up with a few natural twinges of conscience now and then, when he was not feeling well. The next morning breakfast passed without any reference to the scene of the night before. Martha and Cuthbert both knew of what had happened, but kept silence, and if Mrs. Ashburn had any hopes that Mark would recant, she was disappointed. That evening he informed them that he had taken rooms and should not remain at Malakoff Terrace for more than a few days longer, his announcement being met by a grim, "'Very well, Mark, just as you please,' from his mother, and though her heart sank at his words, and her last hope of prevailing died away, she never returned to the charge in any way, recognising that it was useless." When the day for his departure came, there were no scenes. Even Trixie, who felt it most, was calm, for, after all, Mark would not be so very far away. He had said she might come and see him sometimes. The other two were civil and cold, there being that curious latent antipathy between them and him which sometimes exists between members of a family. Mr. Ashburn had mumbled his good-byes with a touch of emotion and even shame in his manner as he shuffled away to his office. "'I don't want you to feel we've cast you off,' he said nervously. "'Your mother says rather more than she exactly feels at times. "'But it's better for you to go, my boy, better for all parties concerned. "'Only, if you find yourself in—in in any difficulties, come back to us. "'Or—that is,' he amended, "'write, or come to me at the office. That will be better, perhaps.' But Mrs. Ashburn's last words were, "'Good-bye, Mark. I never thought to part with a son of mine in anger. We may never meet again, but you may live to be sorry for the grief you have caused your mother, when you stand one day over her grave.' This would have been more impressive if Mrs. Ashburn had not been so much addicted to indulging in doleful predictions on less adequate occasions that she had discounted much of the effect that properly belonged to them. Even as it was, however, they cut Mark for a moment— he half offered to embrace his mother, but she made no response, and after waiting for a while and finding that she made no sign, he went out with a slight shrug of expostulation. When he had left the room, she half rose as if to follow, but stopped half-way, irresolute. 
while the cab which he had engaged to take himself and his luggage to his new quarters drove off and then she went upstairs and shut herself in her bedroom for half an hour and the maid who was doing the rooms hard by reported afterwards to the cook that she had heard missus taking on awful in there a sobbing and groaning and praying she was altogether like it quite upset her to ear it there were no traces of emotion on her face however when she came down again and only an additional shade of grimness in her voice and manner to tell of the half hour's agony in which her mother's heart had warred against her pride and her principles End of chapter eleven Chapter twelve of the Giant's Robe by F. Anstey. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter twelve Launched Mark had now cut himself adrift and established himself in rooms in one of the small streets about Connaught Square where he waited for his schemes to accomplish themselves he still retained his mastership in st peter's although he hoped to be able to throw that up as soon as he could do so with any prudence and the time that was not occupied by his school duties he devoted to the perfecting of his friend's work it was hardly a labour of love and he came to it with an ever-increasing weariness all the tedious toiling through piles of proofs and revised proofs the weeding out of ingenious perversions which seemed to possess a hydra-like power of multiplication after the first eradication began to inspire him with an infinite loathing of the book which was his and not his own it had never interested him he had never been able to feel the slightest admiration for any part of it and at times he ceased to believe in it altogether and think that after all he had transgressed to no purpose and that his own book would have been a stronger staff to lean upon than this reed he had borrowed but he had to go on with it now and trust to his good luck for the consequences but still there were moments when he trembled at what he had done and could not bear to be so constantly reminded of it there was a little story in the book which one of the subordinate characters told to a child the distressing history of a small sugar prince on a twelfth cake who believed himself to be a fairy and was taken tenderly away from a children's party by a little girl who as the prince supposed would restore him somehow to his proper position in fairyland instead of which however she took him home to an ordinary nursery and ate him mark was doubtful of the wisdom of retaining this story in the book at all it seemed to him out of place there but as he had some scruples about cutting it out he allowed it to remain a decision which was not without after effect upon his fortunes the title of the book underwent one more change for mr fladgate's mind misgave him at the last moment as to his own first suggestion and it was finally settled that the book should be called illusion which suited mark quite as well as anything else and so in due time mark read with a certain curious thrill the announcement that illusion a romance by cyril ernstone was now ready at all libraries he sent no presentation copies not even to trixie he had thought of doing so but when it came to the point he could not it was early one saturday afternoon in march mark had walked back by a long round from the school to his lodgings through the parks and the flower beds were gay with lilac yellow and white of crocus and snowdrop the smoke blackened twigs were studded with tiny spikes of tender green and the air was warm and subtly aromatic with the promise of spring even in the muddy tainted streets the lent lilies and narcissus flowers in the street sellers baskets gave touches of passing sweetness to the breeze mark felt a longing to get further away from the town and enjoy what remained of the afternoon on higher ground and in purer air he would go up to hampstead he thought and see the lights sweeping over the rusty bracken on the heath 
or walked down over highgate hill and past the quaint old brick houses with their high trim laurel hedges and their last century wrought iron gateways and lamps in which the light of other days no longer burns but he did not go to either place that afternoon for when he ran up to his rooms to change his hat and coat he saw that on his table which made him forget his purpose altogether it was a packet enclosed in a wrapper which bore the name of his publishers on the outside and he knew at once before opening that it contained reviews he tore off the wrapper eagerly for now at last he would learn whether he had made a bold and successful stroke or only a frightful mistake beginners have taken up reviews before now cowering in anticipation before the curse of Belam to receive an unexpected benediction but perhaps no one could be quite so unprepared for this pleasant form of surprise as mark for others have written the works that are criticised and though they may have worked themselves up into a surface ferment of doubt and humility deep down in their hearts there is a wonderfully calm acceptance after the first shock of the most extravagant eulogy the opening paragraphs of the first critique were enough to relieve mark's main anxiety holroyd's book was not a failure there could be no doubt of that it was treated with respectful consideration as the work of a man who was entitled to be taken seriously if reviews had any influence and it can scarcely be questioned that a favourable review has much this one alone could not fail to bring illusion its fair share of attention mark laid down the first paper with a sense of triumph if a very ordinary book like poor holroyd's was received in this way what might he not expect when he produced his own then he took up the next here the critic was more measured in his praise the book he pronounced to be on the whole a good and very nearly a great one a fine conception fairly worked out but there was too strong a tendency in parts to a certain dreamy mysticism here mark began to regret that he had not been more careful over the proofs while the general tone was a little too metaphysical and the whole marred by even more serious blemishes the author continued the reviewer whose style is for the most part easy and dignified with a praiseworthy absence of all inflation or bombast seems at times to have been smitten by a fatal desire to split the ears of the groundlings and produce an impression by showy parades of a not overwhelmingly profound scholarship and the effect of these contrasts would be grotesque in the extreme were it not absolutely painful in a work of such high average merit what for instance will be thought of the taste of a writer who could close a really pathetic scene of estrangement between the lovers by such a sentence as the following the sentence which followed was one of those which mark had felt it due to himself to interpolate this was but one example said the inexorable critic there were other instances more flagrant still and in all of these the astonished mark recognized his own improvements to say that this was for the moment an exceedingly unpleasant shock to his self-satisfaction is to state a sufficiently obvious fact but mark's character must have been very imperfectly indicated if it surprises any one to hear that it did not take him long to recover from the blow perhaps he had been wrong in grafting his own strong individuality on an entirely foreign trunk he had not been careful enough to harmonize the two styles it was merely an odd coincidence that the reviewer struck naturally enough by the disparity should have pitched upon him as the offender by and by he grew to believe it a positive compliment that the reviewer no doubt a dull person had simply singled out for disapproval all the passages which were out of his depth. If there had been nothing remarkable about them, they would not have been noticed at all. And so, as it is a remarkable peculiarity of the mind of man, that it can frequently be set at ease by some self-constructed theory which would not bear its own examination for a minute, as if a quack were to treat himself 
with his own bread pills and feel better mark having convinced himself that the reviewer was a crass fool whose praise and blame were to be read conversely found the wound to his self-love begin to heal from that moment that same saturday afternoon mabel was sitting in the little room at the back of the house in which she received her own particular friends wrote her letters and read just then she was engaged in the latter occupation for the books had come in from the library that day and she had sat down after luncheon to skim them through before selecting any which seemed worth more careful reading mabel had grown to be fastidious in the matter of fiction the natural result of a sense of humour combined with an instinctive appreciation of style there had been a time of course when released from the strict censorship of a boarding school under which all novels on the very lengthy index expurgatorius had to be read in delicious stealth she had devoured eagerly any literature which was in bright covers and three volumes but that time was past now she could not cry over cheap pathos or laugh at second-hand humour or shudder at sham cynicism any longer desperate escapes and rescues moved her not and she had wearied of beautiful wicked fiends and effeminate golden-haired guardsmen who hold a titanic strength in reserve as their one practical joke but the liberty she had enjoyed had done her no particular harm even if many mothers might have thought it their duty to restrict it which mrs langton was too languid or had too much confidence in her daughter to think of attempting mabel had only returned to the works of the great masters of this century with an appreciation heightened by contrast and though her new delight in them did not blind her as why should it to the lesser lights in whom something may be found to learn or enjoy she now had standards by which she could form her opinions of them amongst the books sent in that week was illusion a romance by cyril ernstone and mabel had looked at its neat grey-green covers and red lettering with a little curiosity for somebody had spoken of it to her the day before and she took it up with the intention of reading a chapter or two before going out with her racket into the square where the tennis season had already set in on the level corner of the lawn but the afternoon wore on and she remained by the window in a low wicker chair indifferent to the spring sunshine outside to the attractions of lawn tennis or the occasional sounds of callers reading on with parted lips and an occasional little musical laugh or involuntary sigh as holroyd had once dreamed of seeing his book read by her his strong and self-contained nature had unfolded all its deepest tenderness and most cherished fancies in that first book and the pages had the interest of a confession mabel felt that personal affection for the unknown writer which to have aroused must be the crown of crowns to those who love their art the faults of style and errors of taste here and there which jarred upon her were still too rare or too foreign to the general tone of the book to prejudice her seriously and she put down the book half finished not from weariness but with an unusual desire to economize the pleasure it gave her i wonder what cyril ernstone is like she thought half unconsciously perhaps by the way a popular but plain author who finds it necessary to cultivate society would discover if he would go about veiled or engage a better-looking man to personate him a speedy increase in the circulation of his next work and if at all sensitive as to his own shortcomings he would certainly be spared a considerable amount of pain for it is trying for a man who rather enjoys being idolized to be compelled to act as his own iconoclast while mabel was speculating on the personal appearance of the author of illusion dolly darted in suddenly oh there you are mabel she said how lazy of you mother thought you were playing tennis and some people have called and she and i had to do all the talking to them come and dress then dolly said mabel putting an arm up and drawing her down to a low stool by her chair 
I've got my new sash on, said Dolly warningly. I'll be careful, said Mabel, and I've found a little story in this book I'm going to read to you, Dolly, if you care about it. Not a long story, is it, Mab? inquired Dolly rather dubiously. But she finally settled herself comfortably down to listen, with her bright little face laid against Mabel's side, while she read the melancholy fate of the sugar fairy prince. Dolly heard it all out in silence, and with a growing trouble in her eyes. When it was all over, and the heartless mortal princess had swallowed the sugar prince, she half turned away and said softly, "'Mabel, that was me!' Mabel laughed. "'What do you mean, Dolly?' she said. "'I thought he was plain sugar,' Dolly protested piteously. "'How was I to know?' I never heard of sugar fairies before, and he did look pretty at first, but I spilt some tea over him, and the colour got all mixed up, just as the story says it did, and so I ate him. It's only a story, Dolly, you know. You needn't make yourself unhappy about it. It isn't true, really. But it must be true. It's all put down exactly as it happened. And it was me. I've eaten up a real fairy prince. Mabel, I'm a greedy pig. If I hadn't done it, perhaps we could have got him out of the sugar somehow, and then Colin and I would have had a live fairy to play with. That's what he expected me to do, and I ate him instead. I know he was a fairy, Mabel. He tasted so nice. Poor, poor little prince. Dolly was so evidently distressed that Mabel tried hard to convince her that the story was about another little girl, the prince was only a sugar one, and so on. But she did not succeed until the idea struck her that a writer whose book seemed to indicate a sympathetic nature would not object to the trouble of removing the childish fears he had aroused, and she said, "'Listen, Dolly, suppose you write a letter to Mr. Ernstone, at his publishers, you know. I'll show you how to address it, but you must write the rest yourself, and ask him to tell you if the Sugar Prince was really a fairy, and then you will know all about it. But my own belief is, Dolly, that there aren't any fairies, now, at any rate. If there weren't, argued Dolly, people wouldn't write books about them. I've seen pictures of them lots of times. And they dance in rows at the pantomime, don't they, Dolly? said Mabel. Oh, I know those aren't fairies, only thin little girls, said Dolly contemptuously. I'm not a baby, Mabel, but I would write to Mr. what you said just now, only I hate letter-writing so. Ink is such blotty, messy stuff, and I dare say he wouldn't answer after all. Try him, dear, said Mabel. Dolly looked obstinate and said nothing just then, and Mabel did not think it well to refer to the matter again. But the next week, from certain little affectations of tremendous mystery on Dolly's part, and the absence of the library copy of Illusion from the morning room during one whole afternoon, after which it reappeared in a state of preternatural inkiness, Mabel had a suspicion that her suggestion was not so disregarded as it had seemed. And a few days afterwards, Mark found on his breakfast table an envelope from his publisher, which proved to contain a letter directed to Mr. Cyril Ernstone at the office. The letter was written in a round, childish hand, with scrapings here and there to record the fall of a vanquished blot. Dear Mr. Cyril Ernstone, it ran, I want you to tell me how you knew that I ate that sugar prince in your story, and if you meant me really. Perhaps you made that part of it up, or else it was some other girl. But please write and tell me who it was, and all about it, because I do so hate to think I've eaten up a real fairy without knowing it. Dorothy Margaret Langton This poor little letter made Mark very angry. If he had written the story, he would, of course, have been amused, if not pleased, by the naive testimony to his power. But, as it was, 
it annoyed him to a quite unreasonable extent he threw dolly's note pettishly across the table i wish i had cut that sugar prince story out i can't tell the child anything about it langton too wonder if it's any relation to my langton sister of his perhaps he lives at notting hill somewhere well i won't write if i do i shall put my foot in it somehow it's quite likely that vincent knew this child she can't be seriously unhappy about such a piece of nonsense and if she is it's not my fault mark had never quite lost the memory of that morning in the fog his brief meeting with mabel and the untimely parting by the hedge subsequent events had naturally done nothing to efface the impression which her charm and grace had made upon him then but even yet he saw her face at times as clearly as ever and suffered once more the dull pain he had felt when he first knew that she had gone from him without leaving him the faintest hope of being ever privileged to know her more intimately or even see her again sometimes when he dreamed most wildly of the brilliant future that was to come to him he saw himself as the author of several famous and successful works amongst which illusion was entirely obscured meeting her once more and marking his sense of her past ingratitude by a studied coldness but this was a possibility that never even in his most sanguine moments was other than remote if he had but known it there had long been close at hand in the shape of young langton a means which judiciously managed might have brought that part of his dream to pass immediately and now he had that which would realize it even more surely and effectually but he did not know and let the appeal lie unanswered that was due to mabel's suggestion the moral of which as alice's duchess might say is that one should never neglect a child's letter End of chapter 12chapter 13 of the giant's robe by f anstey this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter 13 a thorn and flower piece illusion had not been very long published before mark began to have uncomfortable anticipations that it might be on the way to achieve an unexpected success and he was nearer the truth in this than he himself believed as yet it might not become popular in the wider and coarser sense of the word being somewhat over the heads of the large class who read fiction for the story it might never find its way to railway bookstalls though even in this as will appear befell it in time or be considered a profitable subject for transatlantic piracy but it was already gaining recognition as a book that people of any culture should for their own sakes at least assume to have read and appreciated mark was hailed by many judges of such things as a new and powerful thinker who had chosen to veil his theories under the garb of romance and if the theory was dissented from in some quarters the power and charm of the book were universally admitted at dinner parties and in all circles where literature is discussed at all illusion was becoming a standard topic friendships were cemented and intimacies dissolved over it it became a kind of shibboleth at first mark had little opportunity of realizing this to the full extent for he went out seldom if at all there had been a time in his life before he had left cambridge that is when he had mixed more in society his undergraduate friends had been proud to present to their family circle a man with his reputation for general brilliancy and so his engagements in the vacations had been frequent but this did not last from a feeling that his own domestic surroundings would scarcely bear out a vaguely magnificent way he had of alluding to his place and his people a way which was not so much deliberate in position as a habit caught from associates richer and higher up in the social scale from this feeling he never offered to return any of these hospitalities and though this was not rigorously expected of him it did serve to prevent any one of his numerous acquaintanceships from ripening into something more 
when the crash came and it was generally discovered that the reputed brilliant man of his year was a very ordinary failure mark found himself speedily forgotten and in the first soreness of disappointment was not sorry to remain in obscurity for a season but now a reaction in his favour was settling in his publishers were already talking of a second edition of illusion and he received under his name of cyril ernstone countless letters of congratulation and kindly criticism all so pleasantly and cordially worded that each successive note made him angrier the only one that consoled him at all being a communication in a female hand which abused the book and its writer in the most unmeasured terms for his correspondent's estimate of the work was the one which he had a secret wish to see more prevalent so long of course as it did not interfere with the success of his scheme and he could almost have written to thank her had she not by some unfortunate oversight forgotten to append her name and address the next stage in the career of the book was a discovery on someone's part that the name of its author was an assumed one and although there are many authors who would as little think of looking for the name of the man who wrote the play they see or the book they read as they would for that of the locomotive behind which they travel there are still circles for whom the first two matters at least possess an interest and so several set out to run the actual author to earth well assured that as is fabled of the fox he himself would enjoy the sport as much as his pursuers and it is the fact that mark might have given them a much longer run had he been anxious to do so but though he regretted it afterwards the fruits of popularity were too desirable to be foregone there were some false cries at first a london correspondent knew for a fact that the book was written by an old lady at a lunatic asylum in her lucid intervals while a lady's journal had heard that the author was a common carpenter and entirely self-educated and there were other similar discoveries but before they had time to circulate widely it became somehow common knowledge that the author was a young schoolmaster and that his real name was mark ashburn and mark at once began to reap the benefit his old friends sought him out once more men who had passed him in the streets with a careless nod that was almost as bad as a cut direct or without even the smallest acknowledgment that a time had been when they were inseparables now found time to stop him and ask if the rumours of his debut in literature were really true by and by cards began to line his mantelpiece as in the old days he went out once more and met everywhere the kindness and courtesy that the world of london whatever may be said against it is never chary of showing towards the most insignificant person who has once had the good fortune to arouse its interest mark liked it all at first but as he saw the book growing more and more in favour and the honours paid to himself increasing he began to be uneasy at his own success he would not have objected to the book securing a moderate degree of attention so as to prepare the public mind for the blaze of intellect he had in reserve for it that he had expected or at least hoped for but the mischief of his ridiculous enthusiasm which every one he met seemed to be affecting over this book of holroyd's was that it made an anticlimax only too possible when his own should see the light mark heard compliments and thanks with much the annoyance a practised raconteur must feel with the feeble listener who laughs heartily while the point of the story he is being told is still in perspective and soon he wished heartily that the halo he felt was burning round his undeserving head could be moderated or put out like a lamp it was such an inconvenience he could never escape from holroyd's book people would talk to him about it sooner or later while talking to the most charming persons just when he was feeling himself conversationally at his very best he would see the symptoms he dreaded warning him that the one fatal topic was about to be introduced which seemed to have the effect of paralyzing his brain he would struggle hard against it making frantic efforts to turn the subject and doubling with infinite dexterity but generally his interlocutor was not to be put off running cunning as it were like a greyhound dead to sporting instincts and fixing him at once with a 
now mr ash you really must allow me to express to you some of the pleasure and instruction i have received from your book and so on and then mark found himself forced to listen with ghastly smiles of sham gratification to the praises of his rival as he now felt holroyd was after all becoming and had to discuss with the air of a creator his book which he had never cared to understand and soon came cordially to detest if he had been the real author all this would of course have been delightful to him it was all so kind and so evidently sincere for the most part that only a very priggish or cynical person could have affected to undervalue it and any other even if he felt it overstrained now and then would have enjoyed it frankly while it lasted remembering that in the nature of things it could not last very long but unfortunately mark had not written illusion which made all the difference no author could have shrunk more sensitively in his inmost soul than he did from the praise of his fellow-men and his modesty would have been more generally remarked had he not been wise enough to perceive that modesty in a man is a virtue with a dangerous streak of the ridiculous about it and so he braced himself to go through with it and play out his part it would not be for long soon he would have his own book to be complimented upon and to explain meanwhile he worked hard at illusion until he came to have a considerable surface acquaintance with it he knew the names of all the more important characters in it now and hardly ever mixed them up he worked out most of the illusions and made a careful analysis of the plot and pedigrees of some of the families it was much harder work than reading law and quite as distasteful but then it had to be done if he meant to preserve appearances at all his fame had penetrated to st peter's where his fellow masters treated him with an unaccustomed deference only partially veiled by mild badinage on the part of the younger men while even the boys were vaguely aware that he had distinguished himself in the outer world and mark found his authority much easier to maintain how's that young rascal what's his name langton the little scamp who said he called me prawn but not shellfish the impudent fellow how's he getting on hey said mr shelford to mark one day about this time mark replied that the boy had left his form now but that he heard he was doing well and had begun to acquire the graceful art of verse-making verse-making ay ay is he indeed you know ashburn i often think it's a good thing there are none of the old romans alive now they weren't a humorous nation taken as a whole but i fancy some of our prized latin verses would set the stiffest of em sniggering and we laugh at baboo english as they call it but you tell langton from me when you see him if he likes to try his hand at a set of elegiacs on a poor old cat of mine that died the other day i'll look em over if he brings them to me after school some day and if they're what i consider worthy of the deceased men's virtues i'll find some way of rewarding him she was a black persian and her name was jinx but he'll find it latinized well as jinxier tell him and now i think of it he added i never congratulated you on the effort of your muse it's not often i read these things now but i took your book up and maybe i'm too candid in telling you so but it fairly surprised me i'd no idea you had it in you mark found it difficult to hit the right expression of countenance at such a compliment but he did it there are some very fine things in that book sir continued mr shelford some very noble words remarkable for so young a man as you must be you have lived ashburn it's easy to see that oh well said mark i've i've knocked about you know ah oh, and you've knocked something into you too which is more to the purpose i'd like to know now when you found time to construct your theories of life and conduct mark began to find this embarrassing he said he had hit upon them at odd times very odd times he could not help remembering and shifted his ground a little uneasily but he was held fast by the buttonhole they're remarkably sound and striking i must say that and your story is interesting too i found myself looking at the end sir <laughs> to see what became of your characters ah, i knew there was something i wanted to ask you 
there's a heading you've got for one of your chapters a quotation from some latin author which i can't place to my satisfaction i mean that one beginning non terret principes oh that one repeated mark blankly yes it reads to me like later latin where do you take it from one of the fathers one of them i forget which said mark quickly wishing he had cut the quotations out that igritudo now igritudo superveniens you know how do you understand that mark had never troubled himself to understand it at all so he stared at his interrogator in rather a lost way i mean do you take it as of the mind or body that's what made me fancy it must be later latin and then there's the correxit mark admitted that there was the correxit it's mind he said quickly oh decidedly the mind not body and er uh, i think that's my bus passing i'll say good-bye and he escaped with a weary conviction that he must devote yet more study to the detested illusion this is only a sample of the petty vexations to which he had exposed himself he had taken over a business which he did not understand and naturally found the technicalities troublesome for though as has been seen his own tendencies were literary he had not soared so high as a philosophical romance while his scholarship more brilliant than profound was not always equal to the unseen messages from out-of-the-way authors with which holroyd had embellished his chapters but a little more care made him feel easier on this score and then there were many compensations for one unexpected piece of good fortune which will be recorded presently he had mainly to thank his friend's book he had met an old acquaintance of his a certain young herbert featherstone who had on any previous chance encounter seemed affected by a kind of trance during which his eyes lost all power of vision but was now completely recovered so much so indeed as to greet mark with a quite unexpected warmth was it true that he had written this new book what was its name delusion or something fellows were saying he had hadn't read it himself his mother and sister had said it was a devilish good book too where was he hanging out now and what was he doing on the tenth could he come to a little dance his people had that night very well then he should have a card mark was slightly inclined to let the other understand that he knew the worth of this resuscitated friendliness but he refrained he knew of the featherstones as wealthy people with the reputation of giving the pleasantest entertainments in london he had his way to make in the world and could not afford he thought to neglect these opportunities so he went to the dance and as he happened to dance well enjoyed himself in spite of the fact that two of his partners had read illusion and knew him as the author of it they were both pretty and charming girls but mark did not enjoy either of those particular valses in the course of the evening he had a brief conversation with his hostess and was fortunate enough to produce a favourable impression mrs featherstone was literary herself as a reputedly strong-minded lady who had once written two particularly weak-minded novels would necessarily be she liked to have a few rising young literary men in her train with whom she might discuss subjects loftier than ordinary society cares to grasp but she was careful at the same time that her daughter should not share too frequently in these intellectual privileges for gilda featherstone was very handsome and literary men are as impressionable as other people mark called one saturday afternoon at the featherstone's house in grosvenor place as he had been expressly invited to do on the occasion of the dance and found mrs featherstone at home it was not her regular day and she received him alone though mark heard voices and laughter now and then from behind the hangings which concealed the end room of the long suite and now let us talk about your delightful illusion mr ernstone she said graciously do you know i felt when i read your book that some of my innermost thoughts my highest aspirations had been put into words and such words for me it was soul speaking to soul and you get that in so few novels you know what a rapture literary creation is don't you feel that i am sure even in my own poor little way 
you must know that i have scribbled once upon a time even in my own experience i know what a state of excitement i got into over my own stories one's characters get to be actual living companions to one they act by themselves and all one has to do is just to sit by and look on and describe this seemed to mark to prove a vividness of imagination on mrs featherstone's part to which her literary productions had not so far as he knew done full credit but he was equal to the occasion your characters mrs featherstone are companions to many more than their creator i must confess that i for one fell hopelessly in love with your gwendolen vane in mammon and moonshine mark had once read a slashing review of a flabby little novel with a wooden heroine of that name and turned it to good account now after his fashion now how nice of you to say that she said highly pleased i am very fond of gwendolen myself my ideal you know i won't quote that about praise from sir hubert because it's so very trite but i feel it but do you really like gwendolen better than my madeline harwood in strawberries and cream here mark got into deep water once more but he was no mean conversational swimmer and reached dry land without any unseemly floundering it has been suggested to me do you know she said when her own works had been at last disposed of that your illusion would make such an admirable play the central motive really so dramatic of course one would have to leave the philosophy out and all the beautiful reflections but the story would be left have you ever thought of dramatizing it yourself mr ashburn mark could not ah oh, well she said if ever i have time again to give to literature i shall ask your permission to let me see what i can do with it i have written some little charades for drawing-room theatricals you know so i am not quite without experience mark wondering inwardly how holroyd would relish this proposal if he were alive said that he was sure the story would gain by her treatment and presently she proposed that they should go to the further room and see how the young people were getting on which mark received with an immense relief and followed her through the portiere to the inner room in which as will be seen an unexpected stroke of good fortune was to befall him they found the young people together with a married sister of mrs featherstone sitting round a small table on which was a heap of cartes de visite as they used to be called for no very obvious reason gilda featherstone a lively brunette with the manner of a young lady accustomed to her own way looked up from the table to welcome mark you've caught us all at a very frivolous game mr ashburn i hope you won't be shocked we've all had our feelings outraged at least once so we're going to stop now while we're still on speaking terms but what is it said mrs featherstone it isn't cards gilda dearest is it no mother not quite very nearly though mr caffin showed it us he calls it photo nap let me explain mrs featherstone said caffin who liked to drop in at grosvenor place occasionally where he was on terms of some intimacy i don't know if you're acquainted with the game of nap mrs featherstone shook her head not too amiably for she had been growing alarmed of late by a habit her daughter had acquired of mentioning or quoting this versatile young man whom her husband persisted so blindly in encouraging ah said caffin unabashed well anyway this is modelled on it we take out a selection of photographs the oldest preferred shuffle them and deal around five photographs to each player and the ugliest card in each round takes the trick i call it a most ill-natured game said the aunt who had seen an old and unrecognized portrait of herself and the likenesses of several of her husband's family a plain one voted the master cards oh so much must be said for it said caffin it isn't a game to be played everywhere of course but it gives great scope for the emotions think of the pleasure of gaining a trick with the portrait of your dearest friend and then it's such a capital way of ascertaining your own and others precise positions in the beauty scale and all the plain people acquire quite a new value as picture cards he had played his own very cautiously having found his amusement in watching the various revelations of pique and vanity amongst the others and so could speak with security my brothers all took tricks 
said one young lady who had inherited her mother's delicate beauty while the rest of the family resembled a singularly unhandsome father which enabled her to speak without very deep resentment so did poor dear papa said gilda but that was the only one taken in fancy dress and he would go as dante nothing could stand against gurgoyle observed caffyn he was a sure ace every time he'll be glad to know he was such a success you must tell him miss featherstone no i won't have poor mr gurgoyle made fun of said mrs featherstone but with a considerable return of amiability people always tell me that with all his plainness he's the most amusing young man in town though i confess i never could see any signs of it myself the fact was that an unlucky epigram by the mr gurgoyle in question at mrs featherstone's expense which of course had found its way to her had produced a coolness on her part as caffyn was perfectly well aware ars es celare artem as mr bancroft remarks at the haymarket he said lightly gurgoyle is one of those people who is always put down as witty till he has the indiscretion to try then they put him down some other way but why is he considered witty then if he isn't asked gilda featherstone i don't know i suppose because we like to think nature makes these compensations sometimes but gurgoyle must have put her out of temper at the very beginning she's done nothing in that way for him mrs featherstone although aware that the verdict on the absent gurgoyle was far from being a just one was not altogether above being pleased by it and showed it by a manner many degrees more thawed than that she had originally prescribed to herself in dealing with this very ineligible young actor mr ashburn said miss featherstone after one or two glances in the direction of caffyn who was absorbed in following up the advantage he had gained with her mother will you come and help me to put these photos back there are lots of bertie's cambridge friends here and you can tell me who those i don't know are so mark followed her to a side table and then came the stroke of good fortune which has been spoken of for as he was replacing the likenesses in the album in the order they were given to him he was given one at the sight of which he could not avoid a slight start it was a vignette very delicately and artistically executed of a girl's head and as he looked hardly daring to believe in such a coincidence he was almost certain that the pure brow with the tendrils of soft hair curling above it the deep clear eyes and the mouth which for all its sweetness had the possibility of disdain in its curves were those of no other than the girl he had met months ago and had almost resigned himself never to meet again his voice trembled a little with excitement as he said may i ask the name of this lady that is mabel langton i think she's perfectly lovely don't you she was to have been at our dance the other night and then you would have seen her but she couldn't come at the last moment i think i have met miss langton said mark beginning to see now all that he had gained by learning this simple surname hasn't she a little sister called dorothy dolly oh yes sweetly pretty child terribly spoiled i think she will put dear mabel quite in the shade by the time she comes out her features are so much more regular yes i see you know our mabel langton and now do tell me mr ashburn because of course you can read people's characters so clearly you know what do you think of mabel really and truly miss featherstone was fond of getting her views on the characters of her friends revised and corrected for her by competent male opinion but it was sometimes embarrassing to be appealed to in this way while only a very unsophisticated person would permit himself to be entirely candid either in praise or detraction well really said mark you see i have only met her once in my life oh but that must be quite enough for you mr ashburn and mabel langton is always such a puzzle to me i can never quite make up my mind if she is really as sweet as she seems sometimes i fancy i have noticed and yet i can't be sure i've heard people say that she's just the least bit not exactly conceited perhaps but too inclined to trust her own opinion about things and snub people who won't agree with her but she isn't is she i always say that it's quite wrong about her still perhaps 
oh wouldn't you like to know mr caffin he is very clever and amusing you know and has just gone on the stage but he's not as good there as we all thought he would be he's coming this way now here caffin strolled leisurely towards them and the introduction was made of course you have heard of mr ashburn's great book illusion gilda featherstone said as she mentioned mark's name heard of nothing else lately said caffin after which i am ashamed to have to own i haven't read it but it's the disgraceful truth mark felt the danger of being betrayed by a speech like this into saying something too hideously fatuous over the memory of which he would grow hot with shame in the night watches so he contented himself with an indulgent smile perhaps in default of some impossible combination of wit and modesty his best available resource besides the new acquaintance made him strangely uneasy he felt warned to avoid him by one of those odd instincts which although we scarcely ever obey them are surely given us for our protection he could not meet the cold light eyes which seemed to search him through and through mr ashburn and i were just discussing somebody's character said miss featherstone by way of ending an awkward pause poor somebody drawled caffin with an easy impertinence which he had induced many girls and gilda amongst them to tolerate if not admire you need not pity her said gilda indignantly we were defending her ah said caffin from one another no we were not and if you are going to be cynical and satirical and all that you can go away well sit down then and behave yourself what must you go mr ashburn good-bye then mr caffin i want you to tell me what you really think about mark heard no more than this he was glad to escape to get away from caffin's scrutiny he looked as if he knew i was a humbug he thought afterwards and also to think at his leisure over this new discovery and all it meant for him he knew her name now he saw a prospect of meeting her at some time or other in the house he had just left but perhaps he might not even have to wait for that this little girl whose childish letter he had tossed aside a few days since in his blindness who else could she be but the owner of the dog after which he had clambered up the railway slope and he had actually been about to neglect her appeal well he would write now who could say what might not become of it at all events she would read his letter that letter gave mark an infinite deal of trouble after attentively reading the little story to which it referred he sat down to write and tore up sheet after sheet in disgust for he had never given much study to the childish understanding with its unexpected deeps and shallows and found the task of writing down to it go much against the grain but the desire of satisfying a more fastidious critic than dolly gave him at last a kind of inspiration and the letter he did send with some misgiving could hardly have been better written for the particular purpose he was pleasantly reassured as to this a day or two later by another little note from dolly asking him to come to tea at kensington park gardens on any afternoon except monday or tuesday and adding evidently by external suggestion that her mother and sister would be pleased to make his acquaintance mark read this with a thrill of eager joy what he had longed for had come to pass then he was to see her speak with her once more at least he was indebted to illusion for this result which a few months since seemed of all things the most unlikely this time she would not leave him without a word or sign as when they last met he might be allowed to come again even in time to know her intimately and he welcomed this piece of good fortune as a happy omen for the future End of chapter thirteen